Uh, I'm Lisa, I'm the director of the Melbourne Writers' Festival and I'm thrilled to be here with Michelle Law. So, Michelle, yes. you have just got your first book out. Yeah. Called? It's called Shit Asian Mother's Say. So we, <laughs> we had a little event for it this morning. Um, I've co-authored it with my brother Benjamin Law, um, who's a Sydney writer. Um, it's a little sort of comedy book um, that pokes fun at the weird and wonderful things that Asian mothers say. So <laughs> mum's a big supporter of the book and she's been coming to all the events. <laughs> <laughs> she's here this morning, she's in the front row with a video camera. Oh, she put her hand up and say, what shit do I say, Michelle? What shit do oh, I say? Oh god, no, but she was given a microphone. <laughs> 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 so she sort of piped in a bit and was talking about, you know, what she thought of the book and she said how she was proud of us. Wait, tell me more, Mum. <laughs> so apart from your mother, yes. uh, who's the audience for the book? Well, we sort of had wrote it in mind for other, I suppose, children from Asian Australian backgrounds um, to sort of share with their families and sort of have a chuckle over. You know, when you're growing up with a dual cultured family, mm. you sort of feel a bit isolated and to, I guess, have that material, it's, you know, something that everyone can bond over. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the response been? It's been really good. Yeah, yeah. we've had some people who, <laughs> whose mother, have, whose mothers haven't really understood the humour, so they've given it to them for Mother's Day, <laughs> and they've tweeted a photo of this is the moment when we gave it to Mum, and then there's no more tweets because she didn't get it and she's sort of offended. <laughs> but um, no, generally it's been really good, and pe like we had a lot of sort of younger Asian Australian kids coming up and saying, oh, thanks for writing the book because it's nice to have someone who get gets it, and you know they understand. You know, it's just poking fun, but it's come from a place of love. It's interesting that you use the word offence. Uh, your brother, Benjamin Law, yes. uh, is a very offensive human being in a fantastic <laughs> Tell way. Tell me about it. So it obviously <laughs> runs in the family. Oh. But, <laughs> <It's Lisa. laughs> but, you know, it is a book that could be construed as, you know, offensive or you need to get the joke to really love it. Yeah. Um, but it's a hilarious book and a lot of your writing is hilarious as well. Why do you choose to use humour as sort of the vehicle for... Oh. Your work. I guess I really enjoy comedy writing because it's a way to. First of all, I really like social satire, mm. and I think the best way to poke fun at something that you're perhaps upset about or pissed off about is to make people laugh. Because they're always more inclined to listen to you if you make them laugh, which is a really hard thing. Harder mm. even than making people cry, I think. <laughs> and you know, no one's going to listen to you if you stand up on your soapbox and it's quite, you know, a self-righteous rant. But if you manage to get them in on the joke, then they're a lot more likely to respond and be receptive to what you're trying to tell them. Mm. Yeah. So I found that that a lot of my work is sort of quite political, but um, I guess communicated in a way that I want people to get a chuckle out of it as well. Mm. So what are the key messages and ideas that you want to put out, put out in the world through your oh. writing and filmmaking as well? Yeah, yeah. so I had um, a short film and a, and a documentary that came out last year. So the short film was sort of a dark comedy coming of age story called Bloomers. <laughs> and that was that sort of speaks to um, a lot of the issues I'm concerned about, you know, issues to feminism, female, like women's rights. And that film was a, a story about a girl who was the last girl on a class fit a period. And so <laughs> the whole story is her trying to get her period in very <laughs> unconventional ways. Um, and uh, the, the other film that came out was called Suicide and Me. So that was about suicide prevention in Australia. Um, and that's something that's really sort of close to my heart because um, mental illness runs through our family and my, my mum's younger brother actually took his own life. And, those, that sort of, those sorts of events have repercussions, you know, generations and generations after, and it really clarified a lot of the reasons why mum acted the way she did or why she was often sad about things that I didn't mm. understand. And so mental illness is a big one for me and a subject that I like to write about. Um, also illness in general. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm really just interested in topics that um, isolate people. And I started writing... When I first started writing, it was a lot about race because I was growing up on the Sunshine Coast, which at the time was quite a monoculture, and we sort of grew up in that era when Hanson was becoming really, really popular. <laughs> and our, our neighbours had like One Nation, you know, things oh like, like hammered into their lawns. Um, 
And so growing up in that environment where the only other Asian people you really know are your relatives, <laughs> you know, it's something that you really become attuned to at a young age. And I guess writing for me was more of a way to express my frustration and, and deal with things. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you just said isolation. Has writing yeah. helped to dissipate Ooh. any feelings of isolation that you might have had? or Isn't it so ironic? Because it does, but it's such... Um, it's such a solitary activity <laughs> that I'm so physically isolated and you're literally just at home alone in your bedroom or at your desk just writing away in your pyjamas or whatever but I guess I started writing because um, I actually read Jane Eyre in high school I had this really awesome English teacher and up until that point I'd only really read because you know for enjoyment or to pass the time and it wasn't until I read that book that I just had this sense of deep profound connection and it just struck me as amazing because this was you know in 19th century England and this woman had died centuries ago and here I was connecting with a character that she created and I sort of it sort of made sense to me then that people write in order to make connections yep and I really wanted to do the same thing for other people I suppose that's beautiful. Yeah. And so do you read a lot now? Is that a big part of your life? Yeah, well, I, I'm a bookseller. I work part time <laughs> as a bookseller, so I sort of have to read a lot <laughs> and just sort of keep up to date with what's coming out. But I really, I've been really getting into recently, like, um, comedians' biographies, yep. especially um, female comedians' biographies, like um, Tina Fey's Bossy Pants or Mindy Kaling's you know, Hanging Out Without Me and... Um, Amy Poehler has got a book coming out in November, which I've already so pre-ordered. Excited. I've pre-ordered it. Oh as my well. god, I'm so excited! I cannot wait. And Megan Amram, who's yeah. like oh big gosh, Twitter sorry. celebrity, <laughs> has out. and it's just really interesting hearing their perspectives. You know what their experiences have been in the industry as a female comedian, but just comedian in general. <coughs> mm. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm reading at the moment. I just finished my friend Lorelai Vashti's book, yeah. Dress Memory, because um, um, I'll be launching it in Brisbane. But that's um, a memoir of. Um, her 20s so each dress symbolizes a year in her life yeah so check that out <laughs> <laughs> are you interested in writing memoir yourself yeah, yeah I've actually been working on a book of memoir essays um, a manuscript the last couple of years and I, I think because it's just morphed and changed into different things over time that I'm still trying to pin down what I actually want to say mm -hmm. and it sort of started off as a book about illness and then it became one about alopecia which is an autoimmune condition I have and now it just become one of comedic essays in the same, I guess, sedarity in tone. Um, but I guess because I had a lot more that I wanted to say that just wasn't, you know, restricted to illness mm. or alopecia. I just wanted to say a lot. Because you do say a lot and you yeah. talk about your own personal experiences a lot, how do you find the courage or the conviction to actually put yourself out there on the page like that? I, I think because I'm quite an oversharer, it's like... <laughs> Another thing that maybe runs yeah. in the family. <laughs> I, yeah, I think because when I meet people or when I'm making friends with someone, I find the best way to get to know someone is just sort of to put it all out on the table. And I, I don't understand when people are really reserved because they're obviously not really open to being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I really respond to vulnerability because, you know, we're all human and we all have flaws and I want to get to know that person because what makes them interesting. So for me... When people say, oh, you know, it's really brave that you did that TED talk about alopecia. Mm. This is a TED talk I did where I, um, this is a week because I have alopecia. So um, it's an autoimmune condition that causes your white blood cells to attack your hair follicles. So it causes bald patches or um, complete loss of all body hair. Um, and so I took that off and that has been viewed however many times on YouTube. Um, and a lot of people came up to me and said, oh, you know, that was a really brave thing. But for me, it doesn't feel that way it's sort of just more I wanted to reveal things about myself on my own terms yeah I guess absolutely yeah and I guess with writing you have the authority to do that mm. yeah it's your, you telling your own story mm. fantastic yeah. I love that idea does anyone else have a question it sounds yes. like the books that you've been into are mostly non-fiction memoir yeah and have you been into any fiction at all yeah, when I, it was, I the non-fiction biography thing sort of happened in the last few years when I was searching for things that I guess resembled what I wanted to write. But um, in terms of fiction, I love the classics. I'm so nerdy in that way. <laughs> I just love the classics. Um, but I've really gotten into sort of 
contemporary stuff as well. Like um, I was reading Christoph Scholker's stuff, his latest, mm. my Barracuda that came out this year. Mm. Um, some really good contemporary Australian fiction that's coming out at the moment as well. The bookshop that I work at, a lot of the a lot of my co-workers are writers as well, so I get to read. And all of them are mostly fiction writers, so it's nice to read what they're up to and sort of get an idea of what the Australian landscape is shaping up to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel a part of a community of writers in Australia, or do you feel a part of a broader community? I think, yeah, definitely in Australia, and I think in Brisbane as well, because we're such a small pond. Um, I think Mm -hmm. each city has their own group of writers, and it's really nice to be able to meet up at festivals like this one, or at... um, at National Young Writers mm-hmm. Festival as well and actually get to meet people that you know of you know through social media <laughs> or through other friends and actually meet them in person and there, there is this real sense of camaraderie mm. um, and everyone's sort of looking out for each other because it is such a small industry that you know everyone wants to help everyone else you know get as many opportunities as possible. You're just at the very start of your career now. I'm sure it's going to be a long, <laughs> prosperous, amazing career. What do you think that you're going to need in order to succeed in what you say is quite a, a small and difficult industry? Oh, what I need. I think... <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit oh, of a hairy one. Money. Yeah, money. <laughs> I think money and time. <laughs> because... And the of your life. And it's really hard because I'm in a long term relationship and it's hard to separate those parts of your life because when you're writing you're really in your own world and then when you're in a relationship with someone you have to give them the attention that they need as well and give the relationship the attention that it needs and it's really hard to disconnect yourself or like keep those parts of your life compartmentalised especially when you write you know memoir and your life is infiltrated by and your partner is terrified that yes. they're going to appear in the pages of the memoir <laughs> exactly yeah and I think yeah a room is definitely <laughs> a good one Junior Wolf said it right um and I think money is still the same because it's it's really difficult to maintain that sort of writing schedule when you're working a lot of different jobs and mm. just trying to survive um and time is a big one as well um, I think I get sidetracked by a lot of little different yeah. projects and it means I haven't been able to sink my teeth into something really substantial, which is what I'd love to do. And what I really ultimately want to do is sort of be the showrunner of my own comedy show in that, you know, in the way that Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and Mindy Kaling have done. Um, I want to be able to sort of um, represent more women and more Asian Australians and you know, give, diversify what we see on TV and film. Regardless of whether you're writing fiction or non-fiction, you really have to inhabit a character's world and what they do, the people they meet, in order to understand them. And I think that gives you some perspective on what other people are going through. And just as you get older as well, you sort of realise that everyone has their own shit going on. <laughs> and you, anyone down, you know, you think that people have it so great when everyone's struggling with their own issues. Um, and I think also with non-fiction, when you're inhabiting characters who are people you know, you suddenly have this very shocking understanding of what their perspective was of a situation that you that was once very one-sided in your mind, and you're like, oh, actually, that would have been really hard for them. So it sort of gives you a, a much greater understanding of what people are going through, I think. And that's sort of the power in it. And it connects people in that... You know, you could then write that and then approach the person and say, you know, I didn't realise that this was what you're going through. Mm. How do you navigate your personal relationships when you are a, a memoirist who writes about her own life? Um, I think when I write about my family, I'm really lucky in that I guess they're used to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, when Ben wrote his first book, which was a memoir about our family, like, even then we didn't really mind. Mm. I think we were sort of open to the idea of people knowing about our lives because we're really open people and the more that people know about other people, the better, that the nicer everyone will be. Um, I think every time I write something about someone I know, um, I tend to give it to them and see what their reaction is or if they want me to change anything. Mm. And generally, if they have any beef with it, I will. But usually they're okay. Um, I, I tend to avoid writing about people 
when I only have any something negative to say about them because it really just looks like revenge. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of relationships, it's really difficult if you know if you're writing about past romantic relationships, but you're dating someone at present. <laughs> you know, you don't want them to think you know you haven't let go. Oh, you've really got to be upfront with why you're writing it and what purpose it's serving. Mm. Yeah. It's be <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and what was it like collaborating with your brother? It was good. I think it helped that we live in to stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's in Sydney and I'm in Brisbane. But we're actually, we work really well together because we've collaborated on other things. Like his first book is being um, adapted for TV. So we were in the writer's room for that together. Well, we're quite similar workers in that we'll just sort of just give each other's tasks and then go off. Like, with Should Asian Mother Say, we each literally wrote half of the book and then swapped them for edits. And then we came back together for, like, one whole day and just yeah. went through the entire thing together. Yeah. And I think because when you're siblings, there is that unspoken understanding, mm. you know, you know, if something's shit, we're not going to be like, that's terrible. It's just like, <laughs> oh, I don't know. And then we'll just move on to the next thing. You know, it sort of makes it easier, but then it, you bring all these familial issues as well. So it then makes it a little bit harder. Like, he's my older brother, so I can't talk to him in the way that I would to a sibling who's a bit closer in age. Because Ben's eight, old, eight years older than me. And because of, like, with Chinese culture, I never call him Ben. I have yeah. to call him, like, older brother. And it's always the same with any older sibling. Yeah. So everyone in my family, because I'm the youngest, just calls me Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> There's no respect to that. <laughs> but um, I call him Sango, which means like third, third brother. Yeah. Or we have pet names for each other. <laughs> yeah. What does that know? We won't maybe oh. not go there. <laughs> uh, well, he, I call him Bules, and he calls me Mules. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Yeah. Like Basim and Basim. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Anyone else have a final question? I was going to throw one at you. One, I've just finished reading a uh, shit Asian oh, novel. So <laughs> absolutely amazing. Oh, and big confronting. And, yes. Big confronting. Well, the Asian mother in law thing. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I find really interesting is that the idea of, of listening to a, a young writer who is of a different culture, who is female, who is also very Australian, sort of that lovely. Mix of things. Yeah, what am I? It's yeah, like... <laughs> well, one of the things. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things I wanted to ask you. Where Where do you see those three things overlapping? How do you see your identity when you actually put yourself out there? Yeah, it's strange because when I'm in Australia, I say that I'm Asian Australian, but then when I'm abroad, like when I was travelling in America this year and last year, I just say that I'm Australian because that's sort of exotic enough. <laughs> and I think because there's so many uh, Asian Americans that it's just normal for them. But I feel like in Australia, I have to actually state that's what I am um, but yeah it's an interesting cross-section of identities because I suppose and I was talking about this earlier in the event that in the event that I don't really feel I could belong anywhere which is sort of a sad thing but sort of an interesting thing as well <laughs> in that you know in Australia it's always a relief to come home because it is my home you know I was born here and it's all I really know but then when I get to Hong Kong it's like that relief of just disappearing mm. yep. and it's like oh you know I look like everyone else and I'm not the one being looked at Jeez, I, I get the same feeling mm. even being you know white when yeah. I go to Europe I go oh god they all look like me yeah. oh, god. <laughs> I'm not big I'm just European I'm just European, <laughs> European yeah. 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 yeah no totally yeah, yeah, yeah. and you sort of understand your family a lot more yeah. as well like seeing mum in her element and mm. you know in a country where she'd spend most of her teenage years and she's such a huge part of her Although she now prefers Australian culture, <laughs> like so many aspects of it, you know, for instance, um, with Chinese funerals, like she really didn't like when her mum passed away and um, you're not really supposed to weep openly because it's sort of interpreted that those bad spirits will then be taken with the um, person who's just died. So you're sort of supposed to be quite stoic, whereas she likes it with Western funerals, you can be... You know, you can show your emotions yeah. and grieve openly. Um, but yeah, just seeing her in Hong Kong and and interacting with people and just I was, it just suddenly all made sense and I wasn't embarrassed <laughs> anymore. And it was like, oh, okay, now you're in charge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, there's six generations of Chinese people in Victoria. Mm. You know, in Australia, like the, most of us have been here not that long. Yeah. 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 That's right. 
So there's not, I mean, there's more difference than there should be. Yeah. 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 It's, I think it's just like, the visible differences that people can't get over. Mm. It's really strange. Yeah, it is very strange. Yeah, because mm. I'm Australian and mm. I don't really. Yeah, it's just something that I've sort of grappled with and I guess that's why I write because I don't really understand it myself and now writing is just a way for me to try to make sense of it. Mm. It's, I was saying to Michelle before, my, my son is fourth generation Asian Australian and he looks kind of Asian even though there's all that filter up, but yeah. he has no connection with it until he went to Hong Kong and then he realised that he actually looked more Hong Kong, more Asian than he did it yeah. white, mm. like more Asian than his brother and it was all that, that really interesting I think in terms of heritage, yeah. whatever that means. It's very disorienting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I think one of, identity is one of the big things we grapple with over our lives. Yeah. You know, everyone individually is, you know, sometimes about our cultural heritage, sometimes totally. about, you know, the careers we're meant to be in or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. it's That's really right. important work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Yeah. I think as well, um, the point that you, that you mentioned before, Michelle, about um, our Australian identity and how that's reflected on screen and mm. um, yeah. you know we really are not accurately portrayed at yeah. all like yeah. Australians look like all of us yeah mm. yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting because um at the Byron Writers Festival I did a panel with my brother and um another writer named Tasneem Chopra she was on Q&A just last week yeah um and we were talking about how weirdly we all wanted to be actors at one stage yeah. <laughs> but then we were all us we were just totally turned off the idea because we realised that we'd never be able to get work in Australia yeah. and oh, so each, heartbreaking. Yeah, and so each of us just sort of did our own thing because the reality sort of hit us that, you know, if we do get cast, you get typecast or awful misrepresentation and you have to put an accent on mm. and sound more Chinese mm. and it's just doesn't feel right. It's yeah. Just, yeah. Well, hopefully you'll be one of the yeah. women who forges the path for everyone who yeah, comes next. Yeah, to be. Yeah. 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 Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.